Are you as smart as I think you are? <laughs> okay, so um, today we're talking about new beginnings, and basically what I want to show you is I want to show you the length to which God will go to restore and the extent to which he, will, he wants to restore. Before I get there, actually, can I ask you to please share the link now? We live on Instagram and YouTube. Take out your phones. Um, we are going to be, um, and we want to encourage you to send, send out the link to as many people as possible. We live on YouTube and Instagram. And at the end, we're going to put up a slide with, a, you know those things with the twirly patterns? A QR code. There. I got it right. You, you guys are all horrified that I didn't know what a QR code is. I, I'm sorry. But uh, a QR code um, where you can download all the slides. So... You will get it. Okay, so I'm talking to you about the level and extent to which God is, will go to make sure that everything is restored. And so I want to read to you from um, Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11, and it says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in, in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. And so what I want to do is I want to tell you the story from beginning to end. And I want to show you how initially it had started well, then, it, then there was a major plot twist, and then we see how, how God worked everything together to make it even better at the end. So you're following, because basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, from the beginning of time to the end of time. And I'm going to show you that God wants to not just restore, but restore so much more. And the reason why I'm telling you this is because there are places in your life where you've dropped the ball, or someone has dropped the ball on your foot. It's a hard, it's a heavy ball. Or things have gone wrong. Or you've been stolen from. Or you've been abused or misused. And God's plan is in whatever area of your life that you have feel like you've been stolen from or you've lost or you've done something through your own stupidity, God's plan is to take that and restore it, but more. So, are you ready to come on the journey with me? It's great. So, let's start off with how good God made it initially, because only when we understand how good God made it initially will we understand the devastation that Adam and Eve felt. So, let's read. Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man he had made. The Lord God made all sorts of trees grow from the ground, trees that were beautiful and that produced delicious fruit. In the middle of the garden, he placed the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed from the land of Eden, watering the garden, and then dividing into four branches. The first branch, called the Pishon, flowed around the entire land of Havilah, where gold is found. So what we, we have here is a description of an, an idyllic land. Now, what's important to understand is that the whole world did not look like this. There was one place in the whole world and the, that looked like this, and this was the Garden of Eden. So the whole world didn't look like this. In fact, if you read it very carefully, man's job was to take this prototype that God had given them and turn the whole world into that. So there's a, there's a famous preacher called Miles Monroe who's gone to be with the Lord. And he says that God doesn't like bush, he liked garden. He was from the Bahamas, that's why the... 
the language, brilliant, brilliant speaker. Anyway, and, and so God's plan was that Abraham, that, not Abraham, totally different guy, Adam would take this garden and spread it out. But unfortunately, before we really get there, things go wrong. Now, I want, to, I want to pick up something quickly before we go on to the next verse, which is how many, vi- how many rivers flowed from the Garden of Eden? There were four rivers. Now, I was talking to the McManuses from New Orleans, and their problem is too much water. You know, storm surges, floods, Katrina... In fact, I told them, do you know, I think it was 2017, we had 300 millimeters of rain in the entire year, which is like that much. And when I showed them, they were like, we get that in a day sometimes. So we do too every once in a while, but mostly there's these long gaps between that. So, and, and the point is, is that we know of everybody that water brings life. Because think about how lush our city looked in November, December last year. And now, you look, I was walking on the golf course. The last time I played it, it was beautifully green and lush, and now it's yellow. And the reason why is because there's no water. So when you see that Eden had four rivers, we understand how lush it was. This is a beautiful, idyllic place. And um, it carries on, the Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. So what we see here is that there was one thing that, he didn't, that Adam and Eve didn't, ha- didn't or weren't supposed to do, and guess what thing they did? They, they ate the, you know the old saying, there was, you just had to do one thing. Well, in this case, you just shouldn't have done one thing. One thing, and they did it. Can you imagine what happened? So let's quickly read what happened. So the Lord God, when they did that one thing wrong, the Lord God banished them from the Garden of Eden. He sent Adam out to cultivate the ground from which he'd been made. After sending them out, the Lord God stationed the mighty cherubim to the east of the Garden of Eden, and he placed a flaming sword that flashed back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. So what happened is, is they did that one thing, the only thing that they could do to fail, and they did it. Who, and I won't ask you to open, uh, lift your hands, but who here can think back and think, if only I hadn't done that one thing. Do you, let me ask you, do you have friends who you know who did that? <laughs> you can shake your head if you know. Because <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah. And to be honest, I've at times done the one stupid thing. We all have. We've all messed up. Unless, yeah, anyway. And if you're not willing to admit it, then maybe you're messing up more than you think. But the bottom line is, is the punishment that they received for messing up that one thing was that they were banished from perfection, where all their needs were met. Yes, they had to tend and care for the garden, but literally the fruit was was. Hanging on the tree, they just had to pick the low-hanging fruit. They had, they had all the water, all the sh- they, had, they had everything. And so because of that, because of that, imagine the trauma, the disappointment, 
of being banished from perfection and having to scratch away to feed you, yourself and your family. Literally, they went from perfection to total disaster. And um, Jewish tradition tells us that they went and sat in it once they realized how they had messed up, how they had destroyed everything, how they had lost everything. Jewish tradition tells us that they went and sat in the river. And there's some versions, maybe it was the Pishon, maybe it was the Euphrates, the Jordan River. But the bottom line is, is that they sat in the river for 40 days. That's what a tra Jewish tradition tells us. And I think there could be some truth to it. Why? Because imagine the regret that they were trying to process. People get scammed now, 419 scams and all of that. Or four, and this was the ultimate 419 scam. They were caught for absolute suckers. Satan played on their emotions. They did that one thing, and they ended up in a total mess. And not only that, they could see where they were supposed to go, but they couldn't go there. And do you know why? Because there was a cherubim there. Now, who here knows what a cherubim looks like? Most of you think it's a naked little baby with like a halo or something and some wings. Well, let me show you a representation of a cherubim. A cherubim is a monster. And this monster had a sword that flashed, a fiery sword that flashed left and right. Who here would like to go through that? And so, of course, they could see what they had lost. It was there all the time, but there was a cherubim monster preventing from them from getting there. Now, can I float a theory with you? So I'm not an archaeologist, and I don't have, and I don't, I can't prove this out of the Bible, but I'm going to show you how deeply regretful I believe the human race was for losing out of Eden, losing Eden. Are you interested in my theory? Okay. Okay. So, to get to that theory, let's read Ezekiel 28, verse 13 to 14, and it says, You were in the garden, the garden of God. You had access to the holy mountain of God and walked among the stones of fire. Now, what was Eden? It was the garden of God, and it was a... I'll, I'll wait. It was a... It was a mountain. It was a mountain. So if Eden was a mountain and it was guarded by a cherubim, where do we see a man-made mountain guarded by a cherubim that was built 5,000 years ago? It's a sphinx and the, great, and the great temple of Giza. I can't say this for certain, because if you go and check up, everyone says no one knows why they built this, the, 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 the pyramid. But what do we have? We have a cherubim, because that's what the sphinx, sphinx is. I went and checked this. The sphinx is a representation of a cherubim, and do you know what? It guarded a mountain. The, the Sphinx and the Great Pyramid of Giza was an effort to recapture just a tiny sliver of Eden. It was about people, the deep regret of that deep loss of, of being excluded from paradise forever meant that they that they forever regretted, for 
ever regretted losing out on Eden. And so they, what they would do is they would bury the, the king in Eden. Of course, it wasn't Eden because there's, you know, it's, it's dry, it's a desert. But the point is, is this is, I'm trying to show you the deep loss that humankind felt from being excluded from Eden. So what did God do about this deep loss? What did God do to recover everything that humankind had lost? So let's read Acts 3, verse 20 to 21, and it says, Then times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord, and He will again send you Jesus, your appointed Messiah. For He must remain in heaven until the time of the final restoration of all things, as God promised long ago through his holy prophets. So what do we get from the scripture? Number one, that Jesus came, that he's coming again, that he's going to restore all things, and that he had, and, and this was promised through the prophets. Do you see that? So let's see what things will look like when Jesus finally returns. So, so now I'm going to take you to Revelation where God showed John the new Jerusalem. And I'm going to show you that it is a, it's Eden but better. So let's have a look. Revelation 21 verse 10. So he took me in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God. So New Jerusalem comes from God, but where is it going to land? It's going to land on a high mountain. Why? Because Eden was a mountain. The New Jerusalem is a restoration of Eden, but more. New Jerusalem is a restoration of what? Of the New Jerusalem was, is a restoration of what God, what, what we had lost. And I'm going to show you to what extent it's a, it's a restoration. So let's read Revelation 21, verse 3 to 5. And it says, I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are going forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I'm making everything new. So what is the new Jerusalem? It's Eden plus, plus, plus. So God isn't going to leave us where we are, what we've lost. He's going to give back to us but he's going to give back to us so much more. Why am I t talking to you about this? Because I'm, I'm talking to you about this. Because God wants to bring a new beginning into your life. In the areas that you're battling with, the areas that you've lost, God wants to restore, but not just give back what you've lost. He wants to give back more because that's how God works. And I'm trying to show you how God thinks about us. So, so Revelation 21 verse 15 to 17 says, And the angel who talked to me held in his hand a golden measure stick to measure the city, its gates and its wall. When he measured it, he found it was a square as wide as it was long. In fact, its length and width and height were each 1,400 miles. Now, a lot of you don't know what a mile is, but it's... it's um, a kilometer is 1.6 miles. So what we're dealing with here is a 2,000 kilometer high square. So just to give you perspective, I think Everest is something like eight kilometers high or seven kilometers high. So do I think there's going to be a literal 2,300 kilometer square? Maybe, 
But what I really think John is trying to communicate, because of course he's seeing these things, is he's trying to communicate that the new Jerusalem will be everywhere. In other words, he's trying to say that everywhere it will, it will incorporate all of creation, all, everything. So where Jer Eden was, the Garden of Eden was this little thing, the new Jerusalem will be everywhere. Now what, what was square? And I'll give you a clue, it's in the temple. It was the Holy of Holies. Now what was the Holy of Holies? It was that third room. So you had the outer court, you had the holy place, and then you had the Holy of Holies. And only really the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies, and only after fulfilling all kinds of requirements to get there. So what is John saying by saying that the new Jerusalem is a square? He's saying that the, the new creation will be like a giant holy of holies, which confirms the scripture that we can enter into his throne of grace, into his presence. His plan is wherever you are in the new Jerusalem, you will be in his presence. The whole of the new Jerusalem will be the holy of holies. The whole of the new Jerusalem will be where God is. Everywhere you go will be in the presence of God. Where, where Eden, the, the Garden of Eden, was only in the Garden of Eden that God lived. In the temple and the tabernacle, it was only in the Holy of Holies. You will live in the presence of God 24-7 wherever you go. That's God's plan of restoration. In fact, it goes on to say, I saw no temple in the city, for the Lord Almighty and the Lamb are its temple, and the city has no need of sun or moon, for the glory of the Lord illuminates the city, and the Lamb is the light. There's no night. What a, the lights never go off. Guys, you South Africans, the lights... Did, did you catch what I was saying? The lights never go off. We had people from overseas two weeks ago. We were sitting in the restaurant and lights go off. We just carry on talking. But in the New Jerusalem, the lights never go off. Why? Because God lights every part of it, everywhere there's going to be fellowship with God. Where Adam and Eve had been cut off from the presence of God, guess what? Everywhere you go, not only will you experience the presence of God, you'll experience His light. Its gates will never be closed. Who here would, would like to sleep with their front door open? I would. I would like to live in an environment where you don't need a front door. That's what, that's what this is. It never, there's no violence. There are no enemies. And, all, and it says, and the end of days, because there's, there's no night there. The lights never go off. The sun never stops shining. The presence of God, or the God never stops shining. And all the nations will bring their glory and honor into the city. Nothing evil will be allowed to enter, nor anyone who practices shameful idolatry and dishonesty, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So there will be no evil there. When the Spirit, then it says, when the Spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court, and the, this is from Ezekiel, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple, and the glory said and, and the Lord said to me, Son of man, this is the place of my throne, the place where I will rest my feet. I will live there forever among the people of Israel. We will, God will live with us forever. He won't withdraw his presence as in Eden. He won't take it away. We will live with him forever and ever. This is Eden, but so much better. 
Revelation 21, verse 3 to 4. It confirms this. It says, I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He'll wipe every tear from their eye. There will be no more death or sorrow, or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. You see, it's Eden, but it's better. God, God, saw where Adam and Eve were in the state of utter mourning, and his plan is to take us to, a pl- to Eden, but so much better. And then the angel showed me a river with the, the water of life. Now, where, where did Adam and Eve go when they were mourning? They went and sat in the river. And so now, what does God do? He puts riv- a river in the new Eden, in the new Jerusalem. And it's as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God, of the Lamb. So where did did the rivers flow from in Eden? From the mountain of Eden. Where Where do the rivers flow? They flow from God himself. And it flowed down the center of the main street. On each side of the river grew a tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit and with a fresh crop each month. The the leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. In Eden, there was how many trees of life? One. Everywhere down the river, there's trees. Every single tree is a tree of life. Every single tree is a tree of healing. Every single tree is a tree of restoration. Everywhere. And the river, the water itself will restore you and heal you. This is so much better than Eden. This is God's plan for us. And this is confirmed in Ezekiel who says, the fruit trees of all kinds will grow along both the sides of the river. The leaves of these trees will never turn brown and fall and there will always be fruit on their branches. There will be a new crop every month for they are watered by the river flowing from the temple. Who's the temple? It's God himself. The presence of God. The fruit will be for for food and the leaves for healing. So, every, so where there was just one place for healing, everywhere is designed to receive healing and restoration. What was, what was something small, God is turning into something great and awesome. Ezekiel confirms, then when I sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean your filth will be washed away and you will no longer worship idols and I'll give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you I will take your stony stubborn heart and give you a tender responsive heart and I'll put my spirit in you so you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations so what is God's plan he's given us the Holy Spirit so that we don't have to go the way of Adam and Eve We don't have to fall into sin. We don't have to go end up disobeying. We don't have to to go mess it up. We will not mess this one up. Wherever we are in the the in the in in the New Jerusalem, we'll experience the presence of God. His Spirit will be with us. We can get a foretaste now. Because, yeah, and you saw earlier how the Spirit of God moved and touched so many people. The the presence was here. We could get a taste of that new Jerusalem here as we met together in unity. And most importantly, and Jerusalem will be filled safe at last, never again to be cursed and destroyed. All the curses... That, our stu- that human stupidity, all the curses that humans' actions and hurtfulness that, that we commit against each other will be wiped away. And the curses that we've brought upon ourselves will be washed away. We will be in completely free. So, yeah, I can clap. And so what we saw 
is that Eden was a small microcosm of God's eventual plan. And God knew that Adam and Eve would mess up, that they would sin. God knew that. Why? Because it says that Jesus was crucified before the foundation of the earth. God knows that you are going to mess up. God knows that people are going to hurt you. God's plan is restoration and some more for you. And so, Hebrews 11 verses 8 to 10. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed what God called him to leave his home and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going and even where he reached the land God promised him. He lived there by faith for he was like a foreigner living in tents. And so did Isaac and Jacob who inherited the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. Do you know why Abraham left his family and went to the land God sent him? Because he could see that God wasn't just going to give back them, the human race back Eden. He was going to give them a city built by him himself where we could be with Jesus all the time, where the presence of God could permeate our lives and transform us, that the peace of God could live with us, where our tears are wiped away, our regrets are dealt with, where our hurts are washed away, where, if, where we have healing from the tree and from the trees and from the rivers. God's plan was complete total and utter restoration, and God's plan is to do that for you. So whatever you've lost, whatever's been taken from you, whatever has been damaged, whatever's been hurt, God's plan is to restore it completely and totally back to you and some more. So I want, to, I want to pray for you, and I want to pray for two groups of people. The first group are those that, those that have had something taken from them, or they've lost something, or they've messed up. And you want to give it over to God so that he can restore it back to you and more. Those people, I'm going to pray for you in your, your seats. I'm going to ask you to stand up shortly. And then the second group, I'm going to pray for are those who aren't sure whether they're going to end up in the new Jerusalem. They have no assurance that God, that they are actually going to, one day when Jesus returns, will he come back to fetch them, to take them to the city so let's deal with the first group first, and then we'll get to the second group. So I, I'm not going to call you out. I want to pray for you. I'm going to do a general prayer. If you have lost something, if something has been stolen from you, if something has been taken away from you, I believe God wants to restore it to you. But you need to give it to the Lord. And so what I want to do is if God has been speaking to you and you've been thinking about something you've lost, I want you to stand up. I don't want you to come out. I want you to stand up all over this congregation because I want to pray for you. I'm going to give you a few seconds. If the Lord's speaking to you, you want, and you want something to be restored back to you, I want you to stand up. I'm going to pray for you. God wants to restore it back to you. So many people have stood up. I want, I want to thank you for that. 
because God wants to restore back to you what's been taken. Let's pray. I'm going to ask you to repeat after me. Father, today I see that you want to restore everything that I've lost that's been taken from me and give me back more than that. Today, I give you the area that's been st- taken from me or I've lost. I hand it over to you. I forgive those who've hurt me. I forgive those you've taken from me and today I ask you to come into my heart help me to release the anger the hurt and the pain to you I know that your plan is to make it beautiful and I hand it over to you today in Jesus name thank you Lord Amen I'm gonna, I want you to receive keep receiving let's pray the Bible says when we do not know how to pray we pray with groanings which we do not understand I'm gonna pray let's pray let the spirit move you and move and touch you said Bobona praying in the tongue of men and angels to be, as the Holy Spirit has filled me. I want you to re- respond, lift your hands up, kneel down. The Lord is wanting to touch you now. Wherever you are, stand, respond to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to touch your heart. And set you free of the hurt, the anger, the disappointment, the sadness that you're battling with. You may be feeling an unfamiliar feeling. You may be feeling like what is this? It's the presence of God. He's come to live with you. He's come to touch you. He's come to set you free. Jesus, touch these people, Lord. Jesus, touch these people. Restore what's been taken. Thank you, Lord, that your plan is to restore seven times. That your plan is to give back and give back and give back and give back. Thank you, Lord, that your plan is to restore more than they've ever lost, Lord Jesus. I ask you to help them to hand it over to you, Father God. Restore. Restore. Thank you, Jesus. Now I want to deal with the second group of people. Those who aren't sure that if if they, if they go now, in other words, if you died today, or, if, or even when Jesus returns, will you end up in the new Jerusalem? Does God love you? Does he want you to be with him? Have you made a commitment to him? Have you opened your heart to him? Have you received Jesus? If you are not sure whether you're going to be in the new Jerusalem, I want to extend an invitation to you today I want to ask you I want to pray with you we want to help you to make sure that you are can be certain that you will live with Jesus one day that you will be in this new Jerusalem that I've described to you I want to pray with you personally I ask everyone to bow their heads and close their eyes if you're not certain whether you're going to be in the new Jerusalem, whether God, whether you want, whether God loves you and He wants you to be with Him, 
whether he wants to bring you into his presence forever, please raise your hand now and say, please pray, pray for me. I, I'm not certain. I want, I want to pray with you personally. Quickly raise your hand. Not going to take much longer. Please, I see that hand. Is there anyone else? But Jesus is speaking. I see another hand. I know that there may be two or three more. That Jesus is speaking. He wants to bring you into his family. He wants to bring you to him. He wants you to live with him forever in this place that's, that's like the Garden of Eden, but so much better. Last chance, if you want us to pray with you personally, please raise your hand. Okay, I'm going to ask everyone to stand up. And if you raised your hand, please come and stand here in front of me. Bring your handbags or whatever you've got with you. We want to pr- I want to pray with you. I-, I want to invite you to come down. I want to pray with you and help you to move. We're not going to, please don't rush for the door. We- we- I'm not going to take much longer. Please come forward. I want to pray with you. If you raised your hand, come stand here in front of me. Another one or two from the gallery. Over here, ma'am. Thank you for coming out. There's some more people coming. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I want to welcome you forward over here. Over here, you can stand here. Over here. Okay, I'm going to pray for you personally. And then what we're going to do is we've got a, a counseling room under the gallery. And, um, and we're going to take you through. We've got people behind the that will pray with you some more and explain what we're talking about. We're going to help you because we want to help you to serve Jesus and come into a relationship with him. Are we ready? Can I pray for you? Father, I want to thank you for these lovely men and women. I bless them, Jesus. I ask you, Father God, to help them to come into your presence. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you I want to thank you that you have a place for them prepared, that you love them, that you care about them. And I pray, Father God, that you will give them an assurance that you want them, you want them with you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that your presence is with us, that you are here now as a, a foretaste of what the new Jerusalem is going to be to live with Jesus forever. Help them to serve you and follow you. Help them to remove the stones and anything else that gets in their way of serving Jesus. And help them to know that you love them in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we ask you to follow that gentleman through? We're going to take you underneath the gallery. Guys, before you leave, I need to talk to you quickly. So what happened was, you can take a seat, in fact. I won't be long, but take a seat. So what happened this week is that at Boysons Park High School, I don't know if you know where Boysons Park is. If you get on Stanford Road and you drive until the road stops, you get to Boysons Park. It takes you about, I don't know, 40 minutes down Stanford Road. It's a long road. And we run a church in that, in that school. And on Thursday, more than 20 kids started to manifest. And so much so that the police were called in. And because and, um, these kids, they, we, we later discovered that they were seeing demonic figures moving around the school and even snakes. And so they started screaming at what they saw. And um, then, then we got there and they, we sort of prayed a bit and then they, re- they had to shut the school down on Thursday. Then they brought, we've, our pastor there is Pastor Fernando. In fact, he's going to be doing 
the offering tonight at our six o'clock service. Um, and, and so he, they, they brought him in to speak to the staff. Pastor Frederick was there as well. He's a pastor in Bloemendal. And then, and then he addressed the whole school. If you want to see him addressing the whole school, you can look on um, our Facebook page. We post the video there. But, but then after that, all hell broke loose. Suddenly, all these guys from all over came in and started praying and causing chaos. And then even some San Gormas came in and started daubing people with whatever they daub people with. It was chaos. And so eventually, we, they prayed for 30 or 40 kids, got them delivered, got some of them saved. But th this morning, Pastor James has been at, at that church and because we're trying to get as many people delivered as possible, it seems like Satan really got into that school. And so I want us to pray for them as we close in prayer. Pray for the school. And I ask you to continue to pray for that school. Satan has a plan, but I believe that God's going to work it out for the school's good. And we're going to see many people to come to salvation. A church has been running about 70, 80 people. I'm, going to tr I'm trusting that it's going to double and even triple out of that. So, but they, we are one body and our body is part of this, of, of what's happening in Boyson's Park. And so I ask you to pray for them just quickly. So we're going to, as we close in prayer, I want us to raise our hands and reach out to, you know, at that point, uh, Boyson's Park down there, we're going to pray. No, no, not yet. I need to make one more announcement before you raise your hands. I love that enthusiasm. Is tonight, Pastor Madge is going to be preaching on, we've been doing a series called The Blessed Life at 6 o'clock, and I want to encourage you to be here because I think it'll help you to walk in greater freedom. And then next week, on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we're going to be doing three prayer meetings live here in church at seven. It's a public holiday weekend, and we're going to be praying on the 18th, 19th, and 20th, I think it is, of March. So I want to make sure that you hear. We're going to be fasting. I want to encourage you to fast for those three days, or one of those days at least. And we're going to see the kingdom of God come in our city. So we're going to close in prayer. So let's, let's reach out. You can stand up and reach your hands out. It's basically that way, due north. Father, we come before you. We're at school and we pray, Father, as a body, as a community, we come into agreement that you are going to work all this out for that school's good. I pray, Father God, that you will raise up that church there, Father God, that they will... They will they will have a mighty effect on that school. I pray, Father God, that those kids will be saved and set free. I pray, Lord, that you will pour people into the kingdom of God. I pray, Father God, that you will, we will see many people come to salvation. Lord, let your kingdom come in our city. Let your will be done in Boyson's Park, Lord Jesus. We ask you to raise up leaders there and across our city, Father God, to bring in the harvest. I pray, Father God, that, that we will see a firehouse on every street in Boyson's Park, but also here across our city. I pray, Lord, that your kingdom will come in Jesus' name. And I pray, Father God, that you, that you we know, Lord, that you will restore and more in Boyson's Park. In Jesus' name, we bless you, Lord. Amen. Thank you for coming. Bless you. Have a good day. See you tonight.